The following program is brought to you by Caltech. I'm uh, Jim Simmons, president of the Caltech Alumni Association this year. Welcome alumni to Caltech's 15th annual alumni college. Uh, by way of introduction, my BS was from Caltech in applied physics in 1972. I'm now in Venture Capital in Menlo Park, California, up north. Uh, in addition to seeking solutions to global challenges, Caltech is accelerating discovery of the universe by designing spacecrafts, telescopes, optics, and microelectronics to investigate galaxies, stars, and solar systems. As the recent spectacular landing of Curiosity to Mars reminds us, we alumni are part of an amazing community. Jean-Louis Chameau noted several weeks ago that the chances of a successful Curiosity landing were only one in three. So congratulations to JPL and the techers on staff whose initiative and expertise made this success possible. This is big. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm sure the mission will yield important information on our universe for years to come. Welcome to all in attendance who are guests of alumni. I'm glad that you're part of what will be a memorable day. Whether this is your first time on campus or one of many visits, we're glad you're able to join us. And one last one note before we continue, I'd like to ask everyone to please turn off or silence cell phones. I've done mine. Okay. Alumni College is designed to give you expert information about one topic in which the Institute has focused its resources. This year, we will hear about research in space exploration an area which, of course, has received considerable attention recently. Today, we'll get an inside look at what all the fuss is about. Each of our five presenters will talk about their particular area of expertise. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from them, and I share your enthusiasm for the new knowledge they will share. To explain more about the extraordinary work of JPL, I'd like to introduce someone who has been a principal investigator on a number of research and development studies and flight projects sponsored by NASA, including his role as science team leader of the Shuttle Imaging Radar Series, team member on the Magellan Imaging Radar for Venus, and team leader of the Cassini Titan Radar. He's a Caltech alum who is currently vice president and director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and professor of electrical engineering and planetary science. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Charles Ilachi. Welcome, sir. Thank you, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here, you know, being also an alumni from uh, Caltech. Uh, I was told my job today is to wake you up, you know, so you are ready. So I thought uh, the best way to wake you up is uh, to have you share with us what actually happened, you know, three weeks ago. So I have a video which, uh, which kind of show you the excitement and, uh, and uh, the daring that the team has done and the engineering challenges that we were facing uh, when we did that landing. But uh, I thought before that, I, considering this is an alumni you know, event, I thought I'll show you, I'll share with you a couple of things. Uh, the first one, uh, there is going to be a test at the end of my talk. <laughs> and the test is, if you recognize this pattern, there are pattern of dots you know, in here. So I let you at the end, if you are good at Morse code, you should be good at deciphering this. But I will, I will come back you know, at the end and tell you what it is. The other one, I mean, uh, you thought about all the excitement which have happened. And it's interesting that th this is a leading team on it. And starting from the right, and we didn't do this on purpose. This is a random selection of people at JPL. <laughs> you had a professor in geology. Adam Steltner is a master's degree in alumni. Uh, Richard Cook in the middle, somehow we missed him. I don't know. He came from somewhere else. You have Pete Teisinger, who was a project manager, uh, BS 67, myself. And even we forgot to notice that the John Grunsfeld at the left in the 80s, he was a visiting fac research faculty in the physics department. Then he decided to go and become an astronaut. He's the one who did a lot of work on repairing the Hubble. And now he's the head of space science at NASA headquarters. So there is a pretty good representation you know, from Caltech. And even missing from this picture, other two key players are Rob Manning, who was a system engineer, who was an overall kind of system uh, manager for the, the technical manager, and Matt Wallace, who was the flight system manager. 
So he was also the guy who was really in charge of building you know, the flight hardware. So clearly Caltech had major influence you know, on, uh, on curiosity. So now I'm going to show you the video about the landing night. I thought that sure will open up. Should be open up. So we'll see how that goes. Needless to say, there was a lot of testing and verification and design before that time. about one ton, you know, in mass, but when you add it to the rest of the spacecraft and so on, what was entering the atmosphere on Mars was about three tons. Six. Uh, and we launched the day after uh, Thanksgiving last three, year. Two, one. Make it start zero. extremely well. Matter of fact, I was worried that it went so well. Because usually I like to see some problems so we can solve them, you know, while we're doing the cruise. <laughs> and then we got, uh, three weeks ago, we got... When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. It still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, which we refer to as the seven minutes of terror, because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. Things are looking good. Coming up on the tree. The April reports entry interface. At this time, it'll begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. We are standing by for guided start, start of guided entry. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. The vehicle just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. At this time, the vehicle is beginning to steer its way to the target. We have seen peak deceleration. That is starting its first tank reversal. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth G's. Tank reversal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. The chill step has separated from a camera the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers per second. On the right is actual picture on the left. Standing by for back chill separation. We are in powered flight. Altitude of one kilometer descending. 
Standing by for stack mate. Stack mate is starting. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. <laughs> Today, right now, the wheels of curiosity have begun to blaze the trail for human footprints on Mars. This is an amazing achievement. Well, today on Mars, history was made on Earth. The successful landing of Curiosity marks what is really an unprecedented technological tour de force. It will stand as an American point of pride far into the future. Well, tonight was, was a great drama that was played. I could only think of the words of Teddy Roosevelt as I was sitting there. It is far better to dare mighty things even though we might fail than to stay in a twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Well, that was the excitement of that uh, three weeks ago. So let me give you a couple of statistics that I think you'll be, uh, you'll be interested in knowing. You know, when we entered the atmosphere, uh, you could imagine we have a mass of three tons, and we were coming in at 13,000 miles per hour. I'm sure you can quickly calculate one half mv square, you know, to kind of help you to figure out uh, the amount of uh, uh, energy we were coming in. But let me illustrate it for you. That's the equivalent of 18,000 Indy 500 race cars going at full speed. So that's the amount of energy we're coming in, and in seven minutes, we had to land softly on the surface. So now it gives you a flavor about this uh, seven minutes of terror, you know, how to consume that energy, you know, with heat shields, parachute, retro rocket, you know, sky crane. So that was one, one thing to remember. The other one, the accuracy with which we landed, you know, after the full trip that we, we got there, uh, is basically the equivalent as if you are in Florida and uh, uh, you hit a golf ball and you want it to land straight in one of the seats at the Rose Bowl. Not in the Rose Bowl, but on one of the seats, you know, in the Rose Bowl. So that's about the accuracy with which we navigated that spacecraft and, uh, and landed it. Uh, now, on the test uh, that, uh, Morse code, that Morse code I was mentioning to you earlier, does anybody know what that Morse code says? It says JPL. <laughs> so as we will be driving, you know, so you'll be having the track, and every few meters will be JPL, JPL. <laughs> By the way, we didn't tell NASA until after we were ready to launch, <laughs> after we built the wheel. Now, I was tempted to put CIT, but I thought that might be a little bit too far, <laughs> you, know, for, you know, for NASA to do that. So, uh, and, and the last thing I want to mention to you, uh, during the landing, just on our website, there were 14 million households watching, just on the website. And then when you add TV and uh, what was happening in Times Square and so on, literally tens and tens of millions of people were watching this, and I'm sure you all have seen the papers and, and the news program. Matter of fact, one, one, uh, one uh, friend of mine who was in Times Square 
you know, send me a note uh, because people there were cheering NASA, NASA, NASA. Also, he said he has never heard somebody cheering a government agency. <laughs> uh, so, so now, since that time, just a quick note, you know, NASA has selected the next mission uh, to go to Mars, and that's uh, what's called InSight. Now, that's a fixed landing, uh, I mean, fixed uh, lander that will be landing in, uh, in 2016, so you can mark your calendar from now. It's September 20th, 2016. I don't know exactly what hour we'll be arriving, but we know for sure we'll be landing you know, on September 20th. So it, it, it will be equally dramatic, not as dramatic, because we don't have the, the, uh, the sky crane approach. That one will be doing basically with a heat shield parachute and then retro rocket all the way down to the ground, because we are not deploying a rover from it. It's just a fixed lander. And it will have on it a seismometer, you know, because we want to look at any Mars quakes, because that will tell us about the inter interior structures, you know, of Mars. And also it will have a probe which will go down about three meters below the surface to measure the heat flux. Uh, and that will give us an insight about the internal property, you know, of that planet. Now, clearly, Curiosity uh, showed a lot of excitement and engagement in the public, and uh, as the title said there, mighty thanks. But I can tell you, each one of the speakers that will be talking to you later today, they have their mighty things also to do. Going from Voyager, which now have been operating for 35 years, I think I'm sure Ed Stone is going to show you the, the excitement and the challenge of that mission. Uh, Fiona will be talking about the new star, even that it's a small mission, but it's revolutionizing. It's a major step. And how do you do X-ray, you know, astronomy? Uh, Sergio Pellegrino will be telling you about large structures in space that we are kind of thinking in the future, you know, for uh, for very large telescopes. And at the end, I think John Grotzinger will also be telling you about the scientific result why we were doing this mission. So definitely, you are in for a great day and an exciting day. I hope you are all awake now, you know, for the next speaker. And thank you, Caltech, very much. Thank you very much, Charles. That really was inspiring. Uh, the Teddy Roosevelt quote definitely applies. Um, so before we continue, I have a few housekeeping uh, items. Bathrooms are on the second floor. Uh, stairs can be found on each end of the lobby. All breaks and meals will take place in Dabney Gardens, directly opposite our entrance here at uh, the Ramo Auditorium. Uh, some of you may be wondering about the colored stickers on your name tag. It does not mean that those are the gold star better than everyone else. <laughs> uh, you'll be happy to know that we'll be leading tours based on your sticker during lunch. Tours will be announced at lunch in 10-minute increments beginning at 1245. If you're part of an early tour, don't worry. You'll have time to return to lunch before you begin the afternoon sessions. The bookstore is open from noon to 2 p.m. and offers a special 20% discount for alumni college attendees. Just show your name tag uh, to take advantage of this offer. Mars Science Laboratory merchandise will be available for purchase as well as Caltech caps, t-shirts, decals, and pins. All sessions are being recorded and will be available to the public on iTunes U by October 1st. You'll be notified when they are available online. Audio of your questions will be included in these recordings. Uh, please speak to an Alumni Association staff person at the registration desk if you have questions or concerns. Okay, if you are attending tonight's buffet reception and keynote by Mike Brown at Dabney Gardens, the reception begins at 5.30, followed by the keynote at 6 p.m. Participants who are attending the buffet only may pick up name tags this evening at the registration table in the lobby. We are fortunate to have such notable faculty speakers with us today. There will be time allotted to ask questions once the speakers have completed their talks. Please note that the speakers will accept questions from the microphone stations at each end of the aisle. Uh, of course, uh, the conversations will be lively, so uh, please refrain from uh, speaking from your seat. Uh, be courteous to those at the mic and join the line if, you would ask, if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, many of uh, our presenters will join us uh, during the breaks and lunch, so I hope you'll have the opportunity to speak with them during one of those times. So now let's get started with our first speaker. I am delighted to introduce him. Uh, his exploration days began in, in 1961 with his first cosmic ray experiments on Discover satellites. He's been a principal investigator on nine NASA spacecraft missions and a co-investigator on five other NASA missions. 
One of his most famous contributions to space exploration is his continuing role as project scientist for the Voyager mission, whose twin spacecraft studied Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune between 1979 and 1989. The Voyagers are still traveling in space and are expected to continue returning scientific information as they reach the outer bounds of our solar system in the next few years. I'd like to present the David Morris Rowe Professor of Physics and the Vice Provost for Special Projects in the Division of Physics, Mathematics, and Astronomy, Dr. Ed Stone. Well, good morning and welcome. Nine o'clock in the morning is, a, is an early start. Uh, most, when you were probably undergraduates, you probably didn't start that early, actually. <laughs> But good, Thank, great you're here. Uh, this is a very exciting time, and uh, uh, Charles just had a wonderful video showing you that. And it reminded me, really, uh, there are five front, space is the newest realm of human activity. It's, that, it's just over 50 years old now. Uh, and, and there really are five frontiers to this new realm. The obvious frontier, the physical frontier. Uh, going places nothing has been before. Uh, and that's a very important part of the frontier. Another part of the frontier is the knowledge frontier, learning about what's out there, finding what's out there and understanding it. Then there's the technology frontier, that is developing the tools, like curiosity, that one can use in this new realm of human activity. Then there's the applications frontier, where we take advantage of near-Earth space to better the quality of life here on Earth. JPL is involved in all four of those frontiers in major ways, as I'm sure you all know. And the fifth frontier is what I call the human frontier. That is the capability of humans to function in space, uh, because that is a big challenge as well. And it's a frontier in the sense there's a lot to be learned. Now, these frontiers are immense. Uh, it's clear we will never explore all of, expand all of these frontiers in all directions. We have to make choices about what we do, where we go, what we try to learn, what we try to develop, uh, and, and what applications. So, that, so those are the challenges we face all the time in creating these programs. But something like Curiosity clearly shows the, the importance of uh, having a plan to be able to, to do these missions, which extend for uh, major periods of time and development, as well as operations. I hope Curiosity is going to be on the planet surface for many, many years. So what I'm going to talk about is about a mission that started 40 years ago, actually, in 1972. It actually had a false start in an earlier version of it, but it got the start in the current version in Ju July of 1972. So this is 40 years since it started, and 35 years since the launch, five years. This, was, uh, this is the Voyager mission. And, uh, let me get the right switch on. Well, I'm on one. Uh, I'm on my computer. Let's uh, see what happens here. Let's try this. Is that going to happen here? There we go. Oh, there we go. All right. A journey to the edge of interstellar space. And it's a journey, as I say, that started in terms of design and, and construction 40 years ago, started in actual uh, leaving the Earth. 35 years ago. Uh, August 20th uh, was Voyager 2, and September 5th coming up is, was Voyager 1. Now, the, the mission uh, was a initially a mission just to Jupiter and Saturn, because uh, in 1977, the space age itself was only 20 years, uh, 20 years old. Uh, and so there was no way to know that, in fact, a spacecraft could last so long and go so far. In fact, there were challenges even getting to Mars back in those days. There's still challenges in getting to Mars, as you know. Uh, and this is a, so here's Mercury peeking out behind Venus. Uh, these are not Voyager images. Mercury, there's now an orbiting spacecraft there. Uh, Venus, of course, had the Magellan mission with its radar, uh, Earth and its moon, and Mars, which is where curious, Curiosity is today. And then there are the giant outer planets, and that was the initial phase of Voyager, was just a, a, a uh, one of the two spacecraft surviving a four-year mission to Saturn. That was the original part of the mission. Now, this is just to illustrate why there was interest in visiting these four. Uh, these, these are to scale in size, not, of course, into distance, but in scale in terms of size. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and there's the Earth. So you can see these are indeed giant planets. They formed in the outer solar system 
where, ice, where water is, uh, becomes ice, and therefore there's a lot more solid material out of which to uh, build planets, and can, they can therefore attract large atmospheres of hydrogen and helium. There may, there's no solid surface, as far as we know, on any of these giant planets. Uh, and the distances are enormous. Uh, remember, when this was designed, this was back when just getting to Mars, which is one and a half times as far from the sun as the Earth. The Earth is one AU, one astronomical unit from uh, the sun, 93 million miles. Jupiter is at five. That means the sunlight is 1 25th. Saturn's 10, sunlight's 1 100th. Uranus is 19, sunlight is 1 360th. And then there's Neptune, where it's 1 900th. And of course, that means the signal coming back from those distances are similarly down in intensity uh, from those great distances. Uh, so, what, what, how did this journey get started? It got started because Gary Flandreau, a Caltech graduate student in aeronautics, was working at JPL in the summer of 1965. Uh, he had given the task of looking for opportunities to use the swing by of a planet to help speed a spacecraft uh, on its way. And he noticed, when he was plotting the position of planets, that if you launched a spacecraft in 1977, plus or minus about a year, you could fly by all four. They were all lined up like this uh, from, uh, from Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So one spacecraft could fly by all four. That's an opportunity that happens every 176 years. So we knew we had a limited time to get this mission built and on its way. Uh, and the, uh, so there were two because it was not clear that even one could survive, and the mission was initially just a mission to Saturn. So they flew by Mars, Voyager 1, and then Voyager 2 in March and July of 1979. Then Voyager 1 flew by Saturn in 1980, and Saturn, was, with its ring plane, was inclined like this in the sky, and since we wanted one of the objectives was to fly behind the rings so we could measure uh, what the size of the particles in the rings, that meant Voyager 1 headed up out of the plane. If Voyager 1 had not succeeded at Saturn, Voyager 2 would have done the same thing because it, the mission success was a flyby of Saturn. Fortunately, Voyager 1 worked, uh, and that meant we could leave Voyager 2 in the plane of the planets, flying by Saturn in such a way that it was headed toward Uranus. And at, Ur at Uranus, we picked a name point, so we headed on to Neptune. And at Neptune, we flew over the top of Neptune because its moon, Triton, is down behind in a very inclined plane, and that sent Voyager 2 southward. So following uh, 1989, Voyager 2 was heading southward, and Voyager 1 was heading northward. And at that point, it was, became the Voyager Interstellar Mission. And that's the mission that's been on now since 1990. This is the spacecraft. This certainly was the technology frontier in the early 1970s, the first fully automated spacecraft to fly itself. It had three computers to fly the spacecraft, and each computer had 8,000 words of memory. <laughs> and each word is about one and a half bytes, so 12,000 bytes of memory in each computer. That's what we had for the whole, still have for all the whole mission. But it was advanced technology in those days. Uh, and so there were a number of key uh, developments on the Voyager spacecraft that have given it its very long life. And one part of that has been the power supply, which is a radioisot natural radioactive decay of plutonium-238, creates a very hot source, lots of thermal couples converting the heat to electricity, a very robust, simple power supply. It decays away with an 88-year half-life, so we can predict rather precisely when we will no longer have enough power to send the data back to Earth. Uh, so, Voyager to Jupiter, number one mid-stop, 5 AU out, uh, the largest of the giant planets. We knew about the Great Red Spot. What Voyager showed was it's a huge hurricane-like storm system, which is about three Earths across. 
but it also found that all these other white spots you see, every one of those is a hurricane-like storm system. The atmosphere is riddled with them, and even that one is almost as large as the Earth. So the scale is quite different, obviously, on these giant planets. And, under, and we really got our first clear understanding of the, of the properties of the atmospheres of these giant fluid planets. The moons were also incredibly interesting. That's Io and Europa. Before Voyager, the only known active volcanoes in the solar system were here on Earth. And the only known ocean in the solar system was here on Earth. And after Voyager, it all changed because we flew by Io. When we saw this, we had no idea what we were looking at. We had never seen anything like it before, and we haven't seen anything like it since. But we learned during the flyby that the reason we looks that way is because there were eight active volcanoes erupting from the surface of Io. The amount of volcanic activity on this little moon is, a, is 10 times that of the Earth. So we go from the Earth being the only place there are active volcanoes to it's not even the most active place in the solar system with volcanoes. And then yeah, this is uh, for some, some of you may have been to the big island in Hawaii with this Kilauea volcano within the caldera that you can, you can actually see. You can't go down in it, but you can see it. Uh, and here's a big caldera. There's a somewhat smaller uh, caldera, you can see. But the scale, the whole island of Hawaii will fit in that caldera. And this is a little moon. So suddenly, our terracentric view is enormously expanded by uh, the Voyager discoveries. This is a twin of Io in the sense the same size, but it's covered with water ice. And the features you see here are just cracks in the water ice, and suggesting that, in fact, there's a liquid water ocean beneath. And the Galileo mission, which re returned to Jupiter and went into orbit and can fly much closer, uh, returned images like this of the icy surface. And you can see what look like ice flows, where the ice is broken apart, and then it's refrozen. Because the tidal, heat, the tidal, uh, tides, uh, the tidal forces from uh, Jupiter are constantly flexing the ice and cracking it. And of course, one of the key questions is, if there's an ocean there, is there a possibility that life, microbial life, uh, resides somehow beneath its icy surface? And are there any places where the ice is cracking today? Because it should be. The tides are still there, where we could get, uh, get to this material uh, without having to go through all of the ice. On to Saturn, 10 times as far from the sun, 10 times as far from the Earth as uh, uh, twice as far from the Earth as, as Jupiter, so one quarter of the telemetry coming back. Uh, and of course, the rings were just spectacular when Voyager got there. Uh, the, the waves in the rings generated by the moons uh, of, of Saturn, and today Cassini is orbiting Saturn, returning just incredible uh, images of the ring system. Uh, but one of the, another interesting moon is this little moon Enceladus. It was when, this is a Voyager image. Uh, this is what we thought the moons might look like, heavily cratered, frozen water ice. They formed four and a half billion years ago, froze, and were beat up by lots of impacts. But you can see there are earthquake faults on this moon. Uh, and there are regions where all the crater, all the impacts have been erased by uh, some process. Well, Voyager didn't find that. Uh, it did notice that, in fact, this surface is snow white. It is the whitest object in the solar system. It reflects almost all of the sunlight, so it's very cold. And the reason for all that, which Cassini found, was there are geysers erupting from the south pole of that moon. So here's a moon which is very, very cold, and yet there's enough thermal activity that it appears as though there's liquid water driving uh, this. And of course, it's snowing on the surface, and that's the reason it looks like fresh snow. Uh, the other moon of Saturn that was incredibly interesting was Titan. Uh, it's uh, almost as big as the planet Mercury, but of course it's a moon because it's in orbit around, around Saturn. Uh, this is uh, uh, about the best image Voyager got. It's very hazy because, in fact, what we're seeing is the haze in the atmosphere. This atmosphere is 50 to 60 percent higher pressure than here on Earth, mainly nitrogen like here on Earth, but no oxygen. Oxygen on Earth is, was produced, is produced by microbes and uh, vegetation. None of that on, on Titan. Instead, there's natural gas, methane, in the atmosphere. And the action of sunlight, rather than creating oxides, as it does here, creates various complex hydrocarbons. 
and some of them polarize into this opaque haze that we cannot see through visually. But we could, in fact, analyze the data and suggest that it, that it would be raining <coughs> liquid natural gas on, on a Titan. That is, the water cycle here on Earth would be replaced by a methane cycle. And this is what the Huygens probe, when it was carried back in 2004 by Cassini, dropping down to the surface as it dropped down, it saw the dry riverbeds, which certainly suggests there was a flow of some fluids, and not water, not at, these 90, not at 94 above absolute zero. It had to be something like methane. And the radar, which Charles is a team leader for, actually can look through that haze and found there are lakes of liquid hydrocarbon on the surface of this world. Now, the relevance to Earth is the chemistry that's occurring there today may, in some important ways, resemble the chemistry in the early Earth's atmosphere before there was oxygen. Uh, so it may hold some very important clues as to how uh, the building blocks of life uh, were created in these methane-rich atmospheres. On to Uranus, almost another factor of two beyond Saturn. Uh, and very little sunlight. As I say, it's three, one three hundred sixtieth of what the, the Earth receives in the way of sunlight. And indeed, you look at it, there's hardly any weather system at all. It is tilted, tipped on its side, by the way. That's another curiosity. When it formed, evidently, something like a Mars object hit it, tipped it over on its side. So when Voyager approached, one of its poles was more or less facing toward the sun. These circles are just artifacts in the camera. Don't paint it. This, this, this is the natural part of it here. And this has been color enhanced so you can see the rotation, but very little in the way of clouds because hardly any energy to drive the weather system out there. One of the curious things, though, really surprising things, was all, again, before Voyager, all the, all the planets that had magnetic poles had their magnetic poles uh, very near the rotational axis of the planet because it was the rotation of the planet which created the electrical currents that generated the magnetic field. And so Earth's magnetic pole is up near the geographical pole. Same thing for Jupiter, same thing for Saturn, same thing for Mercury, but not for Uranus. Its magnetic pole was closer to the equator than to the geographic pole. Totally unexpected. Again, our terracentric view of magnetic fields had to be greatly expanded when we flew by Uranus. And then there's this little moon. Again, probably half water ice. You're looking at a water ice surface. Miranda, it's about 300 miles across. But look at the complexity of the surface of this world. Yes, there are ancient areas like this, but look at all the faults here and more faults in this chevron. And if here's a cliff, a scarp, a cliff which is miles high on a little world that's only 300 miles across. So it, it's just, we, this, this moon had a, a very active geologic life. We don't think it's active now, but it did have, and obviously got frozen in an in-between state. Uh, it did not completely renew its surface, but left some of the old surface and had some new. On to Neptune. 30 astronomical units. One, one nine hundredth of the sunlight, guess what? The fastest winds in the solar system with the less, least energy to drive the winds. Again, a, sort of a, another counterintuitive result uh, that uh, we found. And a great dark spot. Uh, similar, but in fact not the same as the uh, great red spot. Uh, and it, in fact, it has since disappeared. So it was a temporary feature. Uh, here's another spot with a cloud in it. Uh, and guess where its magnetic field is? Down near the equator and near the pole. And this was the last object we visited. Uh, this is the coldest body we've seen, about 40, degree, 40 Kelvin, 40 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, ice is rock hard. Uh, this is an icy surface. This cantaloupe terrain, as we called it, and the faults we believe occurred when this thing was captured. Uh, it's a captured moon. It's a Pluto-sized body which was captured, and as the tidal heating uh, melted it, it created this cantaloupe textured surface, again, which we have not seen anywhere else. But these fault systems are quite clear. This polar cap is not water ice, because this body is water ice covered with an organic hay uh, material. This is nitrogen ice. It's so cold, the nitrogen freezes out into the polar cap. But you'll notice these dark streaks. 
that we actually saw geysers erupting at 40 degrees above absolute zero. So you see, every time we looked, we realized how limited our view was of the solar system and how, how much more diverse the objects are because of these processes uh, which we thought we understood, but in fact, from just an Earth terracentric point of view, we had a very limited uh, database, if you like, to really understand uh, the solar system. Uh, and now that we're seeing s uh, systems around other planets, our ideas are further changing because the solar system is not the classic a prototype for these other systems that are being found at all. Well, what else is there besides all the planets? There is a thing called the heliosphere. That is, the sun's atmosphere accelerates away because it's heated uh, up to a million degrees near the sun. That causes it to expand supersonically a million miles per hour, 400 kilometers per second, and creates a huge bubble around the sun called the heliosphere. Uh, and this was first predicted in 1961 by Gene Parker, who was another Caltech alum, who basically predicted it. And he is correct. There is such a heliosphere. Uh, and the, uh, there, the, the, because the solar wind itself is supersonic, as it begins to reach the outer edge of the heliosphere, it has to slow down. It does not do that slowly. It slows in a sonic shock. Uh, and so there's a termination shock of the supersonic wind. And beyond that, inside the wind is perfectly radial outward because it's supersonic. But outside the shock, it's now subsonic, and it all turns and flows down the tail. That's the model. Uh, and that's the interstellar mission is to try to get outside this bubble. Now, Newton tells us these spacecraft will leave the bubble. The only question is, will they still be operating? OK, so it all gets started with our sun. Uh, this is a SOHO. Uh, video. So has a spacecraft out, part, sort of out near in front of the Earth at the Lagrangian point, uh, looking at the sun 24 hours a day. And you can see that known fact these sunspots erupt, and uh, they carry a magnetic field. And every 11 years, the eruption of the sunspots actually reverses the sun's magnetic pole. So what was north becomes south, and what was south becomes north. Every 11 years, the, the poles reverse, and the sunspots are the mechanism in wh by which that magnetic field uh, is, is reversed over the 11-year cycle. And the, it's the, this is the photosphere. This is the sun we see. If we now look a little bit higher up in the corona, which is the expanding part of the atmosphere, where it's much thinner, it's much hotter. And so you look in uh, at, uh, shorter wavelengths, and now you can see uh, the, tur the very active magnetic field loops, which uh, come and go. And it's when the magnetic field realigns itself and, and, in fact, often reconnects and dissipates that it provides, in some way, we still don't understand, the mechanism for heating uh, the, the base of the corona to a million degrees, causing it to, like, uh, like a, a nozzle for a rocket, causes the wind to s accelerate to supersonic speeds and uh, flow outward. Here's another view from Soho, which is a coronagraph, where the sun is this white circle. It's behind a solid disk, so we block out the sunlight. During a solar eclipse, of course, you can see it right down to the surface, but this is an artificial eclipse. Uh, you can certainly see uh, evidence of this radial streamlining, but there's, this is actually a video, so it's very clear that the wind is there. Here's a comet, and the comet tails were the first clue that there was some kind of radiation from the sun. Uh, it was Gene Parker who predicted this supersonic wind, which nobody believed, but in fact turned out to be true, that there is this supersonic wind. And occasionally, you see these large eruptions during periods of maximum solar activity. And when those magnetic fields suddenly reconnect, you can drive a huge mass eruption. And when those things hit the Earth's magnetic field, it causes auroras, can damage spacecraft and power systems. It's part of what's called space weather. But for my purposes, it is, the, it is the wind which is the source of this huge bubble that we're trying to get outside of. So that was all predicted in 1961. Uh, and uh, here it is, uh, 2012. We're still inside, but we are getting close. So here's a cartoon. Now, those things were actual data. This is just a cartoon version of zooming out from the sun. Uh, you'll see planets flying by as we go out. You'll see a suggestion of the solar wind here uh, flowing radially outward. There are the, all the orbits. 
Here's that termination shock where the wind, and it's not really spherical, of course, where the wind abruptly slows. Nature is never spherical. Uh, and you can see then the wind turns and goes down the tail. Uh, and out in front, there's an interstellar wind which is being deflected around the outside because the, what's in outside has trouble getting in because the magnetic field inside rejects it just as the stuff inside has trouble getting out. So these are two different magnetic regimes, more or less isolated from each other. Uh, if, we, if we now take a big view, look at our galaxy. Again, this is a cartoon. Shows the, the spiral arms of our galaxy. And just to give you a sense of the scale of our heliosphere on the galactic scale, we zoom in. And somewhere in here, in this arm, you will see our little tiny heliosphere. And where this is, the, is sort of the region right in front of it where a shock can form, depending how fast the wind is, uh, that, uh, and as the flow is deflected around uh, this comet-shaped body. Now, what's outside of our solar system? Turns out, in this region nearby, there were many massive stars, 10 times the sun's mass. What happens is they have a very short life. They explode in what's called a supernova. And there was a whole series of explosions 5, 10, 15 million years ago. So reasonably recent on geologic or uh, astronomical time scales. Uh, and, and as those multiple explosions, uh, they, the stars eject most of their mass back out into the interstellar medium. Uh, and they form these large clouds uh, shells, basically, of material. And one of the shells, uh, which is the accumulation of all those explosions, enveloped the heliosphere about 100,000 years ago. So we're inside. Now, this is actually a better vacuum than anything here on Earth. It's, this, all this stuff I'm telling you is really very, very dilute, but it's all real. And, uh, the, uh, and, these, and we are in one of these shells. That shell is moving in this direction. The sun is moving in that direction. So the net effect is we seem to see a wind coming from the galactic center. But it's not. It's just a local wind. These things really exist. This is the Hubble image of the Orion Nebula. There is an invisible helio astrosphere around that star. You can't see the astrosphere, but you can see where the interstellar wind has been deflected and ionized to create this image of the shock. And notice there's another one up there. So these things are really there. We are inside one of these uh, on our way out. Now, I can't show you a picture of ours because it's invisible and we're inside of it, but I can show you your, my kitchen sink. <laughs> and uh, you all have seen this, actually. It happens in every sink. Let the water hit the bottom of the sink. And notice there's a thick ring that forms out here. Inside the ring, the water is blowing, moving radially outward. And it's thinning out. It eventually has to stop, of course. It doesn't stop gradually. It stops in a shock, in this case, a hydraulic jump. And once the water does that, this water can turn and go down the drain. Sound familiar? That's exactly an analog of the heliosphere. And so here's the solar wind. <laughs> here's the helio sheath. And there's the termination shock. And the two spacecraft are now in this region. I'll show you when we cross the shock, because that was a key step in our journey out. So here is an actual mathematical model, a magnetohydrodynamic model, uh, showing the same features. Uh, the, the colors are temperatures. So here's the solar wind part, the supersonic, where the flow is radial. The lines are all radially outward. Here is the termination shock. And that's when you can see the flow can turn and flow down. And this is a real model, not a cartoon. This is a real model of that deflected flow. And here's just all superposed on it. It's the Voyager 1 northward trajectory and the Voyager 2 southward trajectory. You can see the interstellar wind. And its flow lines are deflected around uh, the heliosphere. So another thing that the shock does is it plays a game of ping pong with some of the ions. And uh, if you watch that little red dot, uh, the shock is here. So the wind on this side is fast. The wind on this side is slow. So if this goes up here, it gets a nice hit, like a ping pong paddle. A, and some of them occasionally will come back and get hit again. And they just bounce back and forth across the shock with this converging flow 
and some small fraction of the ions can actually get 5 or 10 percent the speed of light if you have a year to do this. And that's called shock acceleration. So the shock itself is a source of low energy uh, uh, energetic particles. Uh, and here's what we saw as we approached, uh, as we moved out in 2003, 2004, and 2005. We started seeing some of these low energy particles. There's a 10 and 100 times, uh, uh, 100 times the rate. We started seeing some back in 2002, but it was finally in December 2004. Uh, suddenly, the rate jumped up to the highest we'd seen since we left Earth, uh, and it's been that intensity uh, until just recently. Uh, we were at 80, 94 astronomical units when we crossed the shock and the source of particles, 8.7 billion miles from Earth. Voyager 2, which is going southward, and so Voyager 1 is there, all right? <laughs> Voyager 2, Voyager 2, here's the speed of the wind, 400 kilometers per second, 900,000 miles per hour. You can see it's starting to slow a little bit, and then boom, there's the shock. But look. It was at 84 astronomical units, not 94. It was 10 astronomical units closer to the sun in the south than the north. Well, let's look at the kitchen sink. See, the shock is closer here than there, right? Why is that? Because their sink wall is here. Well, there's no sink wall out there, but there is something pushing, and that's something we believe is the interstellar magnetic field that it's inclined in such a way, north-south, it's in a north-south direction compared to the sun's axis, north-south direction, and tilted so that it presses in harder on the southern region than on the north. And in fact, this is another mathematical model which in fact shows a basically uh, a difference of about 10 AU between north and south. And we, so that tells us the field outside has to be strong enough to have a high enough pressure to do that. Uh, and that is another key thing that we've already at least modeled. Now, we'll find when we get out whether we're right or not about this story. Uh, so the other part of the story is that besides having measured the north-south asymmetry, now we are out in this region, the helio sheath. We, are, we expected to see the flow turn, that just slowly turn and end up going along a, a parallel to the surface of the of uh, the heliopause, as it's called, the surface between the inside and outside. Well, another big surprise. Here is the speed. This is not, here's the time. We crossed the shock, remember, back in the end of 2004. So here's 2005, 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10. Here's the speed. I've put the speed over here in miles per hour. We, the real history was 200,000 miles per hour. Remember, outside, before the shock, it was 900,000, so it's much slower. But it wasn't turning. It was just stopping. And none of the models showed a wind which just stopped. And since all, over two years now, we have been in a region where the wind is stagnant, quasi-stationary, a quasi-stagnation region, which was unexpected uh, in the models. It was not in the models. Uh, so we are in this region, have been now for over two years, where the flow is not moving outward. It's not going much any direction. It's sort of just stagnant sitting there, so certainly suggesting that we can't be too far from the heliopause. But again, I, the models cannot tell us exactly how much further we have to go because none of them had this region in them. Uh, now we have, I think, some ideas about how to explain it. But, I th but Nate, time will tell whether we've got that sorted out. OK, so how will we know when we finally get outside the bubble? There are three signatures. Uh, one has to do with those particles I showed you that were playing ping pong with a shock. Uh, they fill this whole region. And they're basically, as the dots suggest, more or less uniform in intensity. But once they reach the heliopause, they will stream away. So we would expect, as we approach the heliopause, we might start losing them, as this artist's sketch suggests. There are fewer of them. And when we get outside, they ought to be gone because they'll just fly away, from, uh, fly away from the heliosphere. So we would expect, as we approach, that we'll start losing the particles out the edge, and then eventually they'll go away. That's one signature. Inside particles, those with maybe 5% the speed of light, uh, will essentially go away after having been there for seven or eight years. 
Uh, the other, another key clue uh, is the particles which are outside. These, when these supernova blow up, they have shocks. That's what forms these large shells. And they also can accelerate particles. And since they're much bigger explosions in our heliosphere, uh, they can accelerate things up to more than almost the speed of light. Uh, so we have a counting rate, which is counting rate of cosmic rays, as they're called, which is a counting rate of particles that have more than half, more than 40% the speed of light. So these are really very fast. And what cosmic rays are are just the nuclei of atoms. Because they're moving so fast, all the electrons are stripped off, and they're just the bare nuclei. Most of the cosmic rays are hydrogen, that is the proton. That's all, if you strip the electron off, you have a proton. Helium nuclei, next most abundant. It's just like in the solar system, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, iron. All of the elements are there. The abundances are a little bit different uh, than in the solar system, but these were particles that were accelerated by the supernova, uh, which created the uh, shell I was telling you about. So they're outside. And the slower ones, the ones which uh, maybe 40 or 30 or 20 percent the speed of light, can't even get in because, again, the magnetic field serves as a, a barrier uh, to keep the particles out. So we would expect, as the, again this artist's cartoon suggests, outside maybe a uniform distribution of cosmic rays. We don't know that even, uh, since we don't know what's out there at the lower energies. Uh, and some of those will diffuse in uh, ways. So the closer we get to the boundary, the more of these we should see. So we, as we move outward, we should expect to see more and more and more. When we cross, then we should see a new intensity uh, that is stable and steady. But we don't know what that level is. Since K can't get in, we don't know how many are out here. We know at higher energies, higher energies, the ones that say 80% the speed of light, they can get clear into Earth. That we know. What we don't know are the ones with the slower speeds that can't get in. And that's what one of the things we'll be discovering. So let's look at what's been happening recently. Uh, with the cosmic rays, the ones that are outside. These are the particles which are outside trying to get in. And this is a counting rate. The units don't matter. It's just a change that I'm trying to point out. Here's 1.38 or so. Uh, and three years later, it's up to 1.7 or so. Increased, the rate of increase over the last three years up to the beginning of 2012 was about 9% per year. So this is that effect of the particles diffusing in a little bit. And the closer we get to the boundary, the higher the rate. And it goes up. And it's going up like this for the last seven years. But this year is different. In one week in May, it jumped up 5%. And it had been going up 9% a year. And in fact, in that month, uh, one month this, uh, following May 8th, it had gone up 9%, uh, uh, the same in a month as it had been going up each year. Oh, that got our attention, you might say. Uh, so what happened uh, with the, uh, the low energy ones, the ones which are inside, uh, trying to get out? Uh, they've been very steady uh, for the last seven years. And here's their, notice first of all, nothing happened to them on May 8th. So we clearly didn't go outside, because we still saw all the particles inside. The inside particles were all still there. No decrease on May 8th. These are the slower ones, the you know, 3 or 5% the speed of light, or which are inside, created inside, trying to get out. There they are, 27 counts per second. That was, oh, OK. Uh, how about June? Hmm, beginning to look interesting. A little tiny dip, uh, sort of declining a little bit. But we've seen variations like this before, because there are uh, dis these, some of these eruptions from the sun actually get out there, and they will cause this counting rate to vary a little bit. It's not perfectly steady. Uh, then July, hmm, well, that's looking more interesting. And then July 28th, and the rate dropped by 50%. The first time, we, in, a, in a half a day, in a half a day, it dropped 50%. So we were scrambling to look at the data. <laughs> <laughs> this is discovery. You see, nothing has ever been there before. So you can see why we're cautious about claiming things. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was a, a five day, uh, five days. Now, the reason we have to realize, in five days, uh, Voyager moves five hundredths 
of an AU, 0.05 AU, in a system which is 120 AU in radius. There's no model that has that kind of resolution that could even uh, predict uh, this kind of thing. Uh, it's just not possible. So we have to change the models to focus just on these really narrow features which are showing up. So that was, uh, that was the end of July. Then last week, <laughs> dropped uh, to only one third of the intensity before it popped back up. Now, those view graphs I showed you are on the web, OK? Anybody can watch. In fact, I get emails all the time. You've left, you've left, you left. Uh, you know, they want to claim <laughs> I mean, we've gone outside. And I, I have to, you know, well, we haven't done that. We can't claim we've gone outside. Well, what about, so that's the inside particles. Clearly, they haven't gone away. There's still eight or nine of them out of 27. They're down two thirds, but they're not zero. And they came back. Um, and then I wanted to, to show you the comparison between the ones inside leaking out. And yes, look at that. The ones outside actually increased, as though there, there's a connection to the outside which lets the things inside get out and the things outside to get in. Uh, so magnetic field is clearly the pipelines along which these particles travel. This is the website. Both of these plots are on the website. We update them uh, basically every day. So you, too, can uh, explore uh, where we are uh, as we head toward interstellar space. Now, there's one other, uh, one other key signature. So I've told you the two, and I've showed you really where, what they look like. There's one other which is very important, which is not so easy, and can't, we can't put it on the website because it's just too complicated to analyze, and it takes weeks of work. And that's the solar magnetic field. The wind carries the solar magnetic field outward. And since the wind is radially, it would be uh, it would sort of like hair standing on end. It, it would just stretch the field lines out as shown here. If the sun were not rotating, the magnetic field of the sun would be pulled out by, this, by the ionized solar wind uh, into these uh, radial lines. But of course, the sun rotates. It has a rotation about every 26 days. And so, Guess what happens to the, to the magnetic field? Well, I thought it was supposed to. There we go. It becomes a spiral, just as in a lawn sprinkler. Uh, as the field is carried out, it's wrapped around. And so the solar magnetic field is a huge spiral. Uh, and this, again, was predicted by Gene Parker. Before anybody believed there was a solar wind, he was already predicting not only is it a solar wind, this is what it's going to do to the solar magnetic field. And indeed, that's exactly what we see. So a spacecraft flying out always sees a field in the east-west direction, like this. It doesn't see a north-south field. It sees the spiral field, east-west. East that's what we have seen. That's what all spacecrafts see, because none has been outside yet. So. What do we expect? So I've tried to sketch. Here's that mathematical model. This is that magnetic field that I said we felt had to be outside, had to, had to be inclined in, in such a way that it pushes in on the south. Here are the spiral fields, which we know. We know they're there because we measure them. And we've been measuring those spiral fields. And when we go outside, it won't be a spiral field anymore. Instead of a field like this, it's going to be a field like that. Something like north, not quite north-south, but more north-south than east-west. That should be a very clear signature. Now, the challenge is, how, how much turbulence is there going to be in this transition? Again, nobody knows. But it's probably not perfectly smooth. And it may be something that takes, uh, you know, perhaps it's 1 AU thick. Maybe the, the, the layer is 1% of the size of the, of the sphere. Then that's, that's 100 days for Voyager to get through it. We just don't know. This is we, we are going to learn in the months ahead. So we were, we're now analyzing the magnetic field data for these same periods of time to see if, in fact, there's any indication that the field changed direction. I don't think there will be, because the particles didn't really go away. But this is another test that we will have uh, in trying to understand where we are in this journey. So today, Voyager 1. Uh, is 11.4 uh, billion miles from Earth, uh, 122 astronomical units. Again, Neptune is at 30. 
So you can see we're four times further out than Neptune, and we're still inside the bubble. Pluto, which is, of course, no longer a planet, but still, Pluto uh, gets out to 50 AU. So we're more than twice as far out as Pluto. And most Kuiper Belt objects, which Mike Brown studies a lot, are inside this bubble. Uh, it turns out that the comets, the Oort cloud, is actually outside the bubble in interstellar space. So that part of the solar system, if you like, is actually in interstellar space. But most of the sensible solar system is inside this bubble. Uh, we travel a billion miles every three years, a hundredth of an astronomical unit every day. And every hundred days, we travel a distance between the sun and the Earth, the fastest spacecraft going, uh, and the most distant spacecraft by far of, of any. Uh, we have enough power from our radioisotope thermoelectric generators to keep all of our instruments on until 2020. Uh, we lose about four watts per year because that's the natural radioactive decay. So we can predict pretty clearly when we will have to turn off one of our instruments. And then over the years, we have to keep turning the next one off, next one off. By 2025, we'll have to turn off all the instruments. And uh, we'll have a little power to run the spacecraft for a bit longer, but most of the power actually goes to the transmitter, which takes 70 watts of electrical power to transmit 23 watts of radio power. So all the data we get comes back on a transmitter 23 watts from 11 billion miles. Uh, now, I would like to think that maybe only days, the next time it drops, it drops and really does drop to zero, but it could be months, maybe even several years. N nobody knows. I, there is no way, we, have no, we don't know enough to predict exactly when we will cross uh, the heliopause. We will know only when it happens, and then maybe for the first time we'll begin to understand the complex interaction between our sun and what's around it that has been created by all the other uh, super exploding stars over the last 15 or 20 million years. The journey continues. Thank you. So I hope there are some questions. Dr. Stone, um, if anyone has a question, please come up to the mic. Thank you very much. Just wondering how you keep the high gain antenna oriented. How we keep the antenna oriented? Yeah, yes. the antenna, of course, always has to point at Earth. And we do that by finding the sun. So we have a sun sensor, which is actually looks through the antenna and says, there's the sun. That points to the sun. And then we have another sensor perpendicular to that, which looks for a star and rotates until it finds that star. Once it has that, then there's a computer program in our 8,000 words of memory, which tells the Earth is right over there. And it just tracks the Earth around the sun uh, year by year. We have a program in there which will fly the spacecraft. If we can't send it another command, it will fly itself until it runs out of power or breaks. Uh, all automated. I might have trouble expressing the question. If you, can you go back to the last slide? So the trajectory from the Earth goes toward the heli through the heliosphere toward the heliopause, which appears very close in this particular direction. Was that yes. chosen on purpose? Was it theorized that that was going to be the right side? And why didn't we go the other way by accident or whatever and end up with no interaction? Pure luck. <laughs> when we launched, we knew the direction of the nose of the heliosphere, but that's not the reason we chose the direction. We chose the direction because we had to go by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Luckily, that was in the direction toward the nose. Pure luck. 176 years ago, I don't know which side of the solar system would have been on, but probably not on this side. We were very lucky. I was going to ask the same question, how did you get so lucky? But uh, <laughs> Did you know about this uh, shell before you arrived? So uh, the shell, you mean this uh, interstellar region? shell? Interstellar shell? Oh, the inter the, well, we knew about, we, we knew that the basic uh, model of the heliosphere around, of an astrosphere around a star was published by Gene Parker in 1961. Uh, so the basic concept was there. We didn't know how big it was because what determines where the heliopause is is how is a balance of pressure from inside balancing pressure from outside. And we know what the pressure inside is because we're inside measuring it. 
We don't know exactly what the pressure is outside. Well, I, on. I meant, did you know about the directionality of the uh, magnetic field of the interstellar shell, the bow shock? Oh, we knew the direction of the interstellar wind was coming from. Yes, you might say, how did we know that? Or, or which year yeah. did you know that? We uh, knew that in the 1960s. Okay. It turns out that uh, the uh, this interstellar the the, the there's a, the, the interstellar wind has two components. What I'm mainly talking about is the ionized part. The ionized part has to flow around the outside because it's ionized and the magnetic field deflects it. But there are just plain atoms in this interstellar medium which are neutral. And those atoms, and they're mainly hydrogen because that's the most abundant uh, atom, but those, hi those hydrogen atoms can flow kind of right in through the magnetic field. Doesn't, I mean, this is a vacuum. Those particles flow right in until they get into about Jupiter's orbit and then they get ionized by the sun. The sunlight ionizes them, or they charge exchange with the solar wind. And suddenly, they're ionized, and they get carried right back out. But it turns out, because the hydrogen comes in this far, if you look outward with a UV instrument in space, you'll see sunlight resonantly reflected back from the cloud of hydrogen that's coming in from interstellar space. So. Well, on the 1960s, they, uh, the French flew an instrument which looked at all the sky and found most of the reflection of the sunlight was coming from this direction. And they said, that's where the hydrogen is, because that's what's doing the reflection. So it's amazing that we actually knew the direction even before, well before Voyager was launched, that, that we had to go. But that's not the reason we went that direction. We were lucky. <laughs> yes? Uh, Keith Roseman, 89. Um, in a lot of ways, this was a mission of serendipitous exploration. You didn't know you were going to get out there. If you were to do this mission today, what are a couple of things you would actually want to do, both sort of technologically and scientifically, on a new mission? Well, we could do a lot, of course, today with the instruments we couldn't do then. I mean, all, all instruments we build today all have their own processors. They have many processors. Here, the spacecraft had only three computers for the whole thing. So there are many things you could do. We'd have a much more sensitive magnetometer. We would have a higher bandwidth so we could return more data, more high time resolution, because you can see things are changing very rapidly. Uh, we would fly an instrument which could analyze uh, the elemental uh, atomic abundances of the winds outside. We can't do that at the, at the very wind energies. We can only measure that at the cosmic ray energies, things that are moving a fraction of the speed of light. We can tell what they are, they are but we do not have an instrument that tells us the, what the wind itself is. Uh, we, we, we just measure the wind, the speed, but we can't say that it's mainly hydrogen. And we, we just can't say that. So there are a number of things. Radio, certainly much better radio system in terms of sensing radio waves which are generated out there. We have a primitive radio receiver which hasn't heard anything lately. Uh, and uh, so, there, so there's a lot we could do now with a mission, but it's, it takes a long time to get there. That's the challenge we have. Fortunately, we had this wonderful planetary part of the mission as part of, of, of getting us at least out to 30 AU. Then keeping the mission going uh, for, since 1990 has not been easy because for a long period of time between 1990 and 2004 when we crossed the shock, it, you know, we didn't know. We didn't know whether we were going to get there or not. We now know we can get there. Uh, it's, it's, it's within reach. I think it's within a few months or a few years. Maybe a few days. I don't know. Are there any plans for such a mission? Uh, there are no plan. There are there are conceptual plans, uh, but the, the most recent decadal survey, which recommends missions for the next decade, this is it's not in that queue. So it, it certainly nothing will happen until you know the twenty third. The next decadal survey is twenty twenty, which will be for the twenty. So thank you. It's some time off. Yes. Uh, my question is more kitchen sink type. I'm curious about the antennas. How do you receive this signal from so far away? Where are the antennas? Well, we have three sets of antennas around the world. They're called the Deep Space Network. There's one set out here in the desert near Barstow. Hmm. There's another set in Spain near Madrid, and a third set in Australia near Canberra. Near, uh, so they, and so that's so as the Earth rotates, one set can always see the spacecraft. Now, it turns out Voyager 2, is by going south, can't be seen from the northern stations anymore. So we can listen only with the antennas in uh, Australia to Voyager 2. Voyager 1, we can listen to from all the antennas still. I want to thank you for a marvelously clear lecture, too. Thank, thank, you. thank you so yeah, much. You're welcome. Yes? 
So most of your power is used for communication. Is there any chance you could lengthen the life of the project by lowering the transmission uh, power and using some of these large uh, uh, radio telescope arrays that I've heard are being developed? Because, you know, your deep space networks, it, only for medium space, maybe not so deep, right? So uh, these large arrays are much larger than the biggest uh, uh, Yes, and that's right. Available, in fact, so. for Neptune, we actually did use the VLA, which is in uh, New Mexico, uh, 27 antennas. We added those to the antennas in uh, California to get the data, high data, highest data rate as we could back from Neptune. Uh, we couldn't really sustain that on a continuing basis. Uh, that's something we could do for a few weeks at a time. And since I can't say when we really need it, uh, it's hard to ask for it. That's the problem. Uh, the other thing, though, that even if we, uh, and we would, we're going to try to get more data coverage, uh, but uh, you have to realize that this is natural radioactive decay. So it doesn't matter whether we use the power or not, it decays. And therefore, you can't save it. We, we might as well use it because it's decaying, right? So, well, right, but you, you would think that if you could use more of the power for the instruments, you wouldn't have to turn off as many. I'm just... Well, but, yeah, but we, yeah, the, 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 but the 23 watts is, we can run this at 18 watts, and we do run it at 18 watts, and then we can, so we have a little margin. That's all part of the margin we have, but we lose four watts a year. Yeah, it's a, one year more. I mean, it's... I'm sure at the end there will be an attempt to try to keep it going as long as we can by whatever tricks we can, taking more risks by doing things, uh, which maybe we can go beyond 2025, but it's somewhere in that time period we will be out of power. So there's not very much data being transmitted. Do you just send it in a big burst in a short period of time? No, no, it's very, no. Uh, we, we do not have any onboard storage for this data, so if we don't get it when it comes down, it's gone. Oh, wow. uh, the data rate, the way this works is you need big antennas on the ground with very good receivers and very low data rate. Our data rate is 160 bits per second. <laughs> well, from 11 billion miles. <laughs> yep, we're happy with 160 bits a second. Yes? Yeah, perhaps I'm misremembering this. I thought that there had been some question on these spacecraft about them not being where they were supposed to be. The question of, or is perhaps that's a different spacecraft, that as they exited the solar system, they uh, were moving yeah. at the wrong rate? There's a thing called the Pioneer Anomaly. Sorry, the Pioneer that. spacecraft or spinning spacecraft, which led the way uh, to the outer solar system. Um, and they were tracked very accurately. And there was a slight deceleration, uh, a billionth of the acceleration of gravity or something like that. It's a tiny, tiny effect. They now have concluded that this was just the uh, uh, thermal radiation from the spacecraft that was doing this. It was not new physics. So, and it hasn't been observed here. So. Uh, no, and, and Voyager, we could not observe it because we, uh, we're uh, Voy the pioneers were spinners and therefore weren't thrusting most of the time. Voyager is thrusting all the time, so you'd never see a billionth oh, of it. Right. I mean, because it's pushing itself that much by just little little puffs all the time. Sure. So, we couldn't measure it. Yeah. Um, I, Lou Frost, uh, class of 65. I thought I'd add a little humor here. Uh, about six months ago, I read uh, the Bible according to Mark Twain, and he imagines himself on a very long voyage in space in 1905, and he goes on for about 20 pages. He's on the way to the pearly gates, so I'm wondering if you're going to find them sometime. <laughs> Well, we keep getting surprised at the fact that... Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's an artifact of the calculation. Uh, this is a magnetohydrodynamic calculation. And this is a plot of the intensity of the magnetic field. The colors are different intensities. You can see the magnetic field in here is weaker uh, and so much stronger here and very strong there. This is uh, the, it turns out, the spiral field the sun has comes out, comes out of one pole and goes in the other pole. 
Uh, and so the spirals, uh, if you like, the spiral goes like this in one hemisphere and it goes the other direction in the other hemisphere. And there's an equator uh, where the two fields are opposed, the north and south fields. And, the, and in this MHD model, uh, it, it, uh, it's an artifact of the model that the magnetic fields annihilate each other. And so it produces a low field region where the separation between the north fields and the south fields are. It's an artifact of the calculation. That, so, good question, uh, but unfortunately, it's not physics. <laughs> I mean, it's a, the number is a numer numerical thing. Uh, it does tell you where the, current, where the current sheet is that separates these two fields. That follows that blue line, but it's, in fact, very thin. It's not as big as that shows. No more questions. Wow. OK. Oh, there's one. There is a corresponding sphere around the Earth where the uh, solar wind runs into the Earth's magnetic yes, field. Yes, correct. The, uh, the forward part of that fluctuates uh, by measurement. Yes. One would expect, then, that if there is a corresponding one in the uh, uh, interstellar uh, sphere around here, that it might also fluctuate in exactly the same way that the one around the Earth yeah. does. Yeah, it's very good. Yes, there, there is, the, if you could just take this drawing, or maybe a better one would be to go back to uh, one of these other ones and just let everybody know what you're, t what you're suggesting, because it's, it's a good suggestion. This one. Uh, there is no solar wind coming out of the Earth, uh, but there is a magnetic field. And the magnetic field of the Earth uh, creates a magnetosphere around the Earth, it's called. Uh, it's created by the magnetic field, unlike the solar wind, which is, unlike the helix, which is created by the solar wind, the plasma. That's, around the Earth, it's created by a magnetic field. Uh, and so it has the same characteristics inside the magnetic field that belongs to the Earth. Outside the magnetic field is, in that case, carried by the sun, because it's a solar wind. And as the, since the solar wind is supersonic, there is a bow shock in front of the Earth. Uh, and as the wind changes because of these ejections, which I showed you in the movie, when those big things come, uh, those big uh, ma coronal mass ejections come, that will compress the Earth's magnetic field to where actually this boundary can move into half of its normal distance. And that's when you can upset power lines because of the ground currents that are developed uh, can, can uh, uh, override the, uh, uh, the uh, safety. Uh, and, uh, that, and so, yes, there's a lot of variability because, not because of what, what's inside is variable, because the wind outside is variable. Now, in the case of the heliosphere, the wind is inside is creating the heliosphere, and there's a wind outside. We believe that because of the scale of things in the galaxy, wind out here will change slowly. But this changes because the sun has an 11-year cycle, uh, and it blows, it has a stronger wind uh, at certain phases, and the heliosphere will be a bit larger. But the models all suggest that this is a few percent effect. I mean, it's still a few AU. It's not like a zero, but it's, it's not large, uh, not as large as the, as the Earth can change, but partly because it's the wind inside pushing out. And as it's a dynamic thing, and by the time it gets out here, it's uh, not nearly as, uh, uh, it, just, it just doesn't move it very far for very long. So yes, it can move in and out. The more interesting thing is that we are, that what's outside right now is a particular shell, which was generated by the supernova. Uh, and we've been in it only 100,000 years. If we, uh, so eventually, within a million years, we'll be in a different part, uh, or we should say the, the different part of this explosion will have passed over the heliosphere. If there's a denser shell, it will compress the heliosphere. And there are some suggestions that the heliosphere could be compressed because of what's outside changing into maybe even to Jupiter's orbit. And of course, that would change the intensity of cosmic rays in here enormously, because suddenly we are right near the edge, uh, even though we're at 1 AU. Uh, so that, that's, there are actually papers been published about predictions about perhaps in the past, Intensities were higher here because the heliosphere was embedded by a, in a much stronger cloud. Or if the cloud is weaker, it goes into some region between clouds, the heliosphere could balloon. 
And we're lucky that it's not ballooning. I mean, we, we would definitely not get outside if the thing were a whole lot larger. And it's certainly possible that if we hadn't been in this cloud, it would be a lot larger today than it is. So again, lucky that it appears to be about the size we can manage. <laughs> Good question. Oh, yes. Hi, uh, so Seth Yellen, uh, class of 89. Uh -huh. Um, you talk about clouds and these pressures. What okay. sort of density of particles are we talking about? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, the density out here is uh, measured in tenths of particles per cubic centimeter. It's, it's a better vacuum than anything yeah. here, but much better than any vacuum. But, but it's real, mm -hmm. but it's just very low density. And the fields are very weak. The fields, uh, let's see, um, let's see. Let me get the units here for you. <laughs> uh, uh, the fields here are two, uh, we think this field right here, uh, just outside the magnetic field, just outside, maybe three millionths of a gauss. The Earth's field is three tenths of a gauss. So you see the fields are very, very weak, but of course they're immense in size, and so uh, you see the, these things uh, interact on a much different scale. And I'm kind of trapped here, but I'll speak loud. Yeah, sure. Yeah. There's some kind of interstellar wind due to a supernova. Yeah, yeah. First of all, how do we know this? And, uh -huh. and uh -huh. what's the possible effects of that? Well, the, one of the effects is it changes the size of the heliosphere, uh, depending on what cloud we're in. But uh, let me see, I'll show you that. This uh, cartoon, uh, well, there we go. Where is it? Somewhere here? There it is. That's the one I want. OK. This is actually a cartoon, obviously, but it's actually based on data. Now, you might say, what kind of data could one imagine creating something like this? Well, uh, astronomers are very clever. They look at starlight, ultraviolet starlight, from a star up here. And it comes in like this. And as it comes in, it will be absorbed by the clouds along the way. And then there's another one over here. And they'll look in that direction. And they'll get a different set of absorptions. And so they'll see the different absorption features due to these clouds. And they try to, you know, like computer tomography, they try to turn it around and say, well, that means we must have these clouds in these locations in order to give this sequence of absorptions that we see in these different directions. It's a tomography. It's a sort of tomography. It's not really tomography, but it's related to it. So they have many stars they've looked at, which they means along certain directions, they know what's along that, they know what's along that direction. And then they try to create a picture out of that. And, and I think there's general agreement that we, are, we just entered this thing uh, within the last 100,000 years, because they can measure the speed of it. And they know, you know so that, that's that kind of it. But these are all in, I mean, they're all models. So they could be wrong. I mean, they are just models. But they're based on data. But the data is this kind of line of sight data looking at a whole bunch of stars in the UV where the, the atoms out there absorb if they're in the cloud. Oh. Of our solar oh, yes. Yeah. That, of course, that was four and a half billion years yes, ago. And, right. uh, but the ones I'm talking about occurred millions of years ago. Right. And so, yes, it's certainly likely. And that's the reason it tends, it, it's, I mean, that's all consistent. That is, the uh, stars form in, uh, in um, uh, giant molecular clouds. And there tends to be, once one star, massive star forms, it explodes, and it triggers other star formation. So you get this kind of thing going on. So there could have been, there must have been something like that happened when the sun formed four and a half billion years ago. All those stars are long gone. Uh, and the, we were just seeing a recent version of that nearby, which affects our sun uh, because it ejects all this stuff. So the same process is going on today as happened four and a half billion years ago when the Earth was created. I mean, when the sun was created and the Earth. Yes. Oh, OK. Here we go. Yeah, Harry? Yeah. Uh, I learned a long time ago that there was no sound in a vacuum. Uh huh. I understand it's not quite a vacuum. Yeah, that's right. But what is the speed of sound? Well, the, uh, uh, it's a, that's determined by the temperature. And the temperature of this stuff out here in the, uh, uh, in the helium sheet, the temperature is about, uh, uh, from a sound speed point of view, is a temperature of, of corresponding to a million degrees. Uh, but the sound is probably not the main issue. It's the, it's the waves in the, plas in the plasma 
the, the magnetic field has waves. Those are typically 50, 60 kilometers per second. So the solar wind is 400, so it's, you know, it's 10 times the speed of the waves. So most of the waves are actually uh, these magnetic waves. Yes? Uh, well, uh, I'm sure there's a tiny effect because if we're, we're now at 100 AU, so that means sometimes we're, if the Earth, Earth goes around the sun, 99 AU, and then 100, and then 101. And so it's a 1% effect, plus or minus 1% effect. Uh, so it's a not a large effect. But only distance, not relative to the no. sun itself. No, no, just distance, yeah. And it's a tiny effect, actually. Yeah? What happened to Pioneer Cayman, the I'm sorry? Oh, Pioneer 1011? There, there, Pioneer uh, 10 is headed down the tail. It's out of power, ran out of power in 2004, and it's going down the tail. Uh, and, uh, Voy and Voyager 1 passed Pioneer in terms of distance. It's going the other direction, of course, and then Pioneer 10 in 1998, as I recall. So Voyager 1 is now the most remote object, and it's faster than Pioneer 10. So it will be always the most re remote object. Uh, Pioneer 11 actually was going more or less in the same direction as the two Voyagers. Uh, it ran out of power uh, in, the, in the 90s, 97 or something like that. So they, bo they both have run out of power. Yeah? Yeah, Erwin uh, Albert, 1967 Aeronautics. Uh, I see you had the hydrodynamic analogy of the water. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. If we use the same kind of hydrodynamic analogy, could we get a, a fair approximation to the to the jump in speed or pressure across? Uh, yeah, it would be a fair approximation. These are a little more complicated because it turns out that uh, uh, I didn't mention it, but since you asked the, the, the let me show you this. Oops, where is the? Uh, there, this one. Uh, this is, the, this is the standard speed for the solar wind, 400 kilometers per second. You notice it did slow down before the shock. And that happened because the particles that are bouncing back and forth, taking the energy out of the shock, actually get upstream and slow the shock down. So it's a more complicated shock. It's, it's where the accelerated particles are actually taking energy out of the wind, and they're fast enough they can get upstream. And, that, and that's the, always the challenge. How do you get the information back upstream? Well, if you create a few very fast particles here and they can get back upstream, they can start slowing the wind down. But could I get within a factor of two? Oh, sure, 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 sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was another question back there, yes. Oh, no, I think there are no, uh, this, no implications for that, no. Yes? Although the RTPs, the RTPs are infallible, do you see us going to anything else with the spacecraft in the future? Uh, yeah, is there any other source of power besides RTGs? Well, there's always a thought of using a nuclear reactor. Uh, and there have, in the early 90s, there was a study to try to develop. It's a very hard, a difficult technology to develop. Um, and, the, and the, and the uh, Soviets actually did fly some nuclear reactors in space, so it's been done. Uh, and, and if you ever want to have 100 kilowatts of power, that's probably what you're going to have to do. So that's another one of these technology frontier things, is developing a space-qualified 100 kilowatt power supply. And it's, not, it's a challenge. Yeah, I can tell you it's a challenge. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's a challenge. When you're far from the sun. Only when you're far from the sun. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, this is for deep space, or even if you want to go to Mars and have 100 kilowatts, you're probably going to want some kind of a reactor, I would guess. Yes? But isn't a reactor's fuel going to decay also? I'm sorry? Isn't the fuel for the reactor going to decay? Oh, I mean, yeah. We're talking 30, well, sure, 40 years. sure. Yeah, it, that will true, but it's, a, it's the power level that you can get. You can get much higher power levels uh, than just from just natural radioactive decay. It takes an awful lot of it. Yes? Do you think the results are extendable to other, say, G5 stars? Well, I think this whole... 
yeah, I think, yes, I think this is informing us about the physics of these astrospheres and the interaction of stars with their surroundings. I mean, we are actually measuring what's going on now for the first time. So it will certainly inform all of those kinds of calculations. Absolutely. OK, all right, thank you. Well, uh, the, uh, at Caltech, the motto is, the truth shall set you free. And to me, this is an example of the search for the truth. And uh, personally, what I saw at Caltech is the very best scientists said very clearly what we know and what we don't know. And by that standard, Ed obviously gave a wonderful presentation. <laughs>